Uh, hi everyone, it's uh, great to give this talk. Uh, it was a little bit subtle to prepare it because uh, on this program that we're running here at KTP, we had uh, in the last couple of weeks several discussions very closely related to this topic. And so a large fraction of participants, they took part in these discussions and then another part didn't. Uh, so I tried to design a talk that it's not too boring for people who already heard about the subject recently and still comprehensible for the others. Let's see how that worked out. Uh, so everybody in this workshop, uh, of course, knows what confinement is. We use somewhat different definitions. So for this talk, my notion of confinement would be an existence of uh, string-like approximately stable objects. And to see that it has something to do with the real world confinement, so it just takes, you know, staring at experimental plots of, um, of the meson spectrum, the uh, famous M squared versus J plot, and we see that they, they you know, uh, up to a rather high spin, and actually it's somewhat surprising, they're going all the way to relatively low spin, uh, the redshift trajectories seem pretty flat, and that is, of course, uh, most uh, simply explained by an existence of you know, semi-classical rotating string. So our long-term goal is to develop uh, some sort of useful description of QCD using strings of flux tubes as uh, basic objects. But, okay, we're not going to do it today. Today we'll take a uh, somewhat more humble goal, uh, which is to understand uh, the some structure of a single confining flux cube. Okay, and, and this is on its own uh, uh, a rather complicated uh, uh, problem. So the summary of the talk is is as following. So we will take uh, uh, for some simplification a large and uh, pure Young Mills, mostly in four dimensions. Also, I mentioned uh, some results about three D as well. So some of the things that I will say will also be true at finite and or not for pure young mills, but to, to make the picture somewhat more clear, let's, let, let's think about uh, this example for now. And then basically in the, in the first uh, part of the talk, I will uh, review some progress uh, that, that happened over the last uh, 10 years or so uh, due to the, the, the following things. So first is uh, the very precise uh, lattice data uh, simulated by uh, uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, Athena Dorobringles and Tepper, and then more recently by uh, papers uh, just by uh, Andreas uh, and Mike. And so almost all the data I, uh, I will be referring to uh, is from the simulations, and I will not you know, reference particular papers, but uh, Andreas already gave a talk where you can find uh, all the more detailed references. Uh, and then uh, our contribution is uh, of, of me and my friends uh, uh, was basically using uh, effective field theory techniques plus uh, some, uh, you know, beyond effective field theory uh, things that were largely inspired by integrability. And, and I, will, I will try to explain, you know, why, uh, what I mean by this. And the, the methodology here is, is basically uh, like this. So we first, you know, use effective field theory to understand some universal part. Then we look at the data. Uh, from this, we derive some, you know, some more fine structure of strings, something non-universal. The uh, major example will be uh, some massive modes that live on the world sheet. Then we make some new predictions for lattice simulations. Uh, Andres and Mike go and do uh, new lattice simulations. Uh, and then they confirm the predictions and, and you know, so this is kind of the uh, almost like the, uh, you know, the ideal physics should work with the uh, exception that we're not doing a real experiment, but uh, for us, a lattice data is an experiment so far, of course. Uh, and then in the second part of, of the talk, I will uh, uh, explain some avenues to make uh, further uh, progress. And one of these is, of course, to eventually apply to real data, but uh, that uh, hasn't been done yet. Um, so two types of effective field theory friendly objects that's worth considering. So uh, first one is a long, almost straight string that spans completely one of the spatial directions. So there will be uh, two setups um, within, within these setups, there will be kind of two uh, sub ideas. One is when the spatial direction is compact, okay? so. Uh, I, I think in some previous discussions, people were getting confused about the setup. So what I draw here is, uh, say, this is time, Lorenz on the Euclidean time, and this is one of the directions that is compact, and the stream winds 
uh, this compact direction, right? There are, say, in 42 more directions that, that can be uh, infinite. And then uh, when this direction is decompactified, the string naturally maps in a, in a string that goes uh, along uh, the uh, entire space in one direction, okay? And then another object is a large spin rotating uh, folded uh, string uh, that uh, Simeon uh, mentioned in uh, his discussions. And first I wanted to talk about it a bit, um, uh, but then I realized I won't have time in 25 minutes. I got some backup slides on it. And uh, also you, uh, I can refer to Guzman's discussion uh, here on the program. Uh, so if in the, in the 10 minutes of discussion we have time, we can, we can discuss this thing as well. Uh, so now, what, what do we know about the two-dimensional world sheet theory that leaves uh, on this uh, single uh, long uh, flux field? So in the end to infinity limit, the bulk uh, or the, the glue balls uh, completely decouple uh, from it, and it is some UV complete two-dimensional theory, okay? Now, there is in the infrared a universal sector of Goldstone bosons uh, uh, that are uh, determined by this pattern of uh, symmetry breaking. So, this is how I denote the Poincare symmetry of, of PCD. Um, and these are the symmetry subgroup that is preserved by this single straight string. So, there are the Goldstone bosons that basically correspond to translations, so displacement of the string in one of the uh, D minus two directions uh, that I label by Xi. And it is convenient to combine these Goldstones together with the code in the tau and sigma that parameterize the world sheet. So, it's a sigma and it's a tau is the time, world sheet time into this uh, guy X mu and uh, uh, construct an action uh, that consists of. Um, uh, geometric invariance constructed of the metric, induced metric and the extrinsic average. And that is basically the coset construction uh, for this uh, uh, part of symmetry breaking. This is something what's called static gauge approach. Uh, there are um, uh, other approaches. I, 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 I will stick to this uh, for this talk. So then uh, following this prescription, uh, we get the uh, effective um, uh, action. So this is what I call S uh, effective uh, string that starts with just the area term, the leading term, the number water term. Uh, then the, uh, there is expansion, uh, derivative expansion controlled by, uh, by LS, by the uh, string width or uh, string tension. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it is well known, the, the invariant with um, uh, two extra derivatives uh, uh, as compared to the leading term, it is a total derivative. So for some uh, local discussions on the world sheet, it does not contribute. Uh, so this gives some extra universality to this world sheet theory. And then uh, uh, we can substitute back our definition of X mu uh, and expand uh, these this things in the power of uh, local interaction terms, canonically normalize the field. And then what we get is some you know, kinetic term for a goldstones, some leading universal interaction, and then some first, non-leading, sorry, first uh, non-universal interaction uh, comes, uh, say, uh, at, at this order, okay? But this alpha is some order one number to be determined. Are there any questions at this point about the, the, the basic setup or about what is the object that I'm studying? Okay, uh, if no, then uh, let me make uh, one, one disclaimer that uh, so massless bosons in two dimensions are subtle, but you can rest assured that in this area there are no infrared divergences. So it is uh, well defined because there are, well, basically because there are enough uh, derivatives uh, per field. So uh, the first uh, object that we're going to study is this world sheet uh, S matrix, uh, which is uh, constructed as follows. So we go to this case where the direct special direction is non-compact, so the string is infinitely long. And basically, we can see the scattering of this Goldstone boson XI, which you can think of scattering of some ripples uh, on the string. So I'll, I'll just list you the results of the exploration of this uh, S matrix. So first of all, the three-level scattering is universal, and it is integrable. For people not familiar with integrability, basically, the meaning is there is no particle production. There is the number of particles in the in state is always the same as the number of particles in the out state. That, of course, puts some severe constraints of how this matrix could look like. I'm sorry, now, the one loop is also universal. Uh, and there is uh, always a particle production. So there is a two to four process, unless you are in 26 or in three dimension. Okay, in particular from this. Victor? Yes. Uh, uh, Zohar had a question, actually. Sure. 
Hi, uh, hi Victor. You, by tree level, you probably mean just the Nambugoto part. Otherwise, it would not be very universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is a, the loop counts. I mean, this term counts as like two loop term. Okay. Uh, yeah, but you mean tree level? You mean? Yeah, tree uh, level derived derived um, from this part because if I add yeah, this yeah. tree level, it's equivalent to doing two loops in uh, in number in in using yeah. the leading term. Yeah, you scale the energies in some way so that only terms with some power of energy are called tree level. Yes, yes, thanks. Okay. Same as in, I think, in Pi and Lagrangian, we would routinely do something. Is any more questions? Yes, loop counting is, I use derivative counting, but okay, I call it loop counting. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, so leading in energy uh, is universal and integrable. Uh, one loop meaning that two more derivatives, uh, two more powers of moment is also universal and has this property. So D, D equal three could have been integrable uh, from you know just symmetry perspective, but it is not as follows from lattice result that I that I'll mention below. Now uh, the S matrix also due to this nonlinear symmetry satisfies uh, the following soft symmetry. Okay, as again, it's, it's common in the case of nonlinear realized symmetry, but here it's a little bit subtle. So if we take some um, uh, uh, on-shell S matrix element and scale moment of, of the uh, particles to zero, say we take a right moving particle, some moment of P plus, uh, naively one could conclude that it should be double soft. And for some higher brain theories, it would have been double soft, but here is a, a term that is actually a scale of a single power of momentum. However, this term uh, can be fixed by on-shell uh, S-matrix elements of you know, one order further, at least if we think of it in, in perturbation theory, or in principle, one can write some uh, exact constraints on the S-matrix uh, that schematically look like this. So this term consists of, of two pieces. So this is my you know, original uh, S matrix elements, I mean, legs, uh, my original external legs, one of them I'm taking small. And here we have an S matrix element with uh, two smaller legs, like this leg will have, this leg will have to go on shelf uh, to, to contribute. And then uh, here is the uh, S matrix element with the original number of legs. Uh, so now this, uh, if S matrix satisfies uh, the soft theorem, it is also a sufficient uh, condition for nonlinear point current bias. So it is a, if one, someone constructs an S matrix that has this property, one can always write an, uh, this perturbatively local action uh, that would fully respect the point current symmetry. And uh, this, this, in particular, uh, the universal particle production is controlled by this uh, uh, soft theorem, and the two contributions cancel only uh, for an S matrix uh, that is. Uh, um, this e to the s uh, tt bar s matrix. So this way one can prove that the only integrable s matrix consistent with um, one kind variance could be the e to the s, s matrix. That is relevant for the three dimension. Okay. okay um, anyway, so, so far we didn't use any input from uh, QCD. So all above is true for any string like object in a Poincare variant. Okay. So uh, to proceed to, to say that we actually study the QCD string, uh, we go to the, uh, to the lattice, okay? So on the lattice, uh, what uh, as, as uh, um, Andreas reviewed in his talk, uh, uh, people mention uh, uh, two, two point function of this uh, Polykov uh, loops. So now we have the X dimension is compact. And from this one can read off the spectrum of strings as a function of their length. So this EN, N labels uh, different levels, uh, excited levels of the string. Uh, and uh, so to compare with this on the theory side, we need to go from the uh, S matrix to the finite volume spectrum. So one could have calculated the spectrum directly from the action in the finite volume, but it turns out uh, to be not the optim most optimal way. And the thing here is there's some order one factors uh, in, uh, in lengths uh, at which our theory uh, converges. They matter a lot here because, of course, on the lattice, one can, you know, one cannot probe asymptotically uh, large uh, distances. 
Uh, so the basic reason for this uh, is that the, the three-level phase shift in the S matrix can actually become order one uh, while uh, loop corrections and, and again loop corrections I refer basically to derivative high derivative corrections uh, they can still be small. Uh, and also, we understand the analytic structure of the S matrix better. I think that, that that's uh, that of uh, finite volume spectrum, which is the more uh, subtle observable. So the basic idea is that this uh, to how you go from uh, the uh, S matrix and the infinite volume to the finite volume spectrum is that the scattering phase modifies the uh, the quantization condition uh, that uh, the wave function on the circle should satisfy. So if we have some, you know, in free theory we have you know p times l. Uh, say let's uh, let's let's recover it. Let's consider a state uh, on this stream where we have two goldstones, say one moving to the left and one moving to the right, just for example. So in free theory, momenta would have to satisfy the condition that p times l is, is two pi n, right? But if there is some scattering phase, it modifies this quantization condition. So now the leading delta in three level delta is uh, ls squared times p squared, it's quadratic in momenta. Uh, and that's like if now we solve this equation for momentum, we get uh, the square root formula, okay? And this is what is uh, referred to in the literature by, as, as number got spec, basically. So the point is that if one starts expanding the square root, uh, then the square root has, of course, non ellipticity and this expansion becomes uh, asymptotic very quickly. However, if we can trust the phase shift, if the phase shift uh, calculation is reliable, so there is some order of, you know, p to the fourth, if this, this piece switches, Again, universal calculable. If it's still small, uh, then we can treat this phase shift exact and go from it uh, to the finite volume spectrum for this two particle state energy, which is simply related to momentum. And this is quite standard in lattice calculations, you know, looser formula. Uh, etc. Uh, there is a little extra subtlety here because uh, we have massless particles and wind so-called winding corrections uh, that uh, come from virtual massless particles again uh, going around the circle. Uh, they are they are quite important. They're not exponentially suppressed; they're just parallel suppressed. And this is where uh, the slow energy integrability and uh, versus uh, tricks related to thermodynamic beta ions uh, uh, can be implemented. And the the basic outcome of those is that this um, uh, quantization condition gets further modified by some winding corrections um, that are uh, uh, that are you know, derived uh, using some integrability techniques. And again, this this correction, the latest data is precise enough to be sensitive to uh, to this kind of corrections. So of course, the given effect, you know, subleading to this. Um, and again, there, there are ways to uh, check that uh, this term is under control. Excuse me. Yes. I ask a question. You said mm -hmm. that in 4D there is no integrability, or do you do you assume that L is very large, so that your theory good, is very good. small, so that your theory reduces to 3D? If L is uh, no, no, I, I'm not again. So there is some. So uh, you see, the, the thing is that there are some approximates. Integrally, because at low energy it's integrable, then, uh, as I said, the universal correction that break integrability, which means that uh, this term, we don't really know how to, you know, calculate it beyond some order, okay? It's an interesting problem how to uh, learn how to calculate this term in a non-integrable theory. But the thing is that, so this term, the structure of this term is that it basically depends on momentum, on real particles, and also of mom on momentum, of typical momentum of virtual particles uh, that run in these loops. And then you you can check that this, uh, you know, the non-integrability, failure of integrability that comes at high enough order, uh, and, and these particles, especially the virtual particles, are soft enough that you can ignore. That's why I'm saying that this term, it's okay for, say, for just this term to use an integrable approximation in S matrix, and, and that is a very good approximation for the states we consider. Okay, it's, it's a rather subtle technical uh, issue. I mean, it's, it's a right question, but... Uh, um, Maybe I can. Maybe you can trust me for now that that it works and it's not the lead, the main effect. Okay. But it, it was a right concern. And, you know, we checked that it's, it's okay. Let me let me show you the results. Uh, so for two goldstone states. So first we uh, just uh, look at at this picture and and this is the situation with uh, pure goldstones. Uh, and okay, there are different states. Uh, different two particle states with, with uh, different quantum numbers. And we see that basically, okay, it, it 
kind of you know goes in the right direction but say there are these red states that are completely off uh, and then um, the uh, the fixture of this uh, was to add the uh, massive uh, world sheet mold that we uh, called the uh, world sheet axion and then uh, one, one, once you add it to the to the action so we had a one particle with a mass and then there's some leading coupling a uh, few that are just two parameters and uh, the feed uh, say to these data points improved by some a ridiculous uh, number of sigmas, uh, and uh, so so this basically what we uh, call the uh, discovery of this first uh, massive excitation on the growth sheet of this thing. So let me uh, point uh, you to uh, to a few uh, things. So first of all, so, and, and I did, you know you could have said all oh, like just by eye this level looks straight, so that's just like a massive particle. But then a uh, huge improvement that you get from actually having, you know, a Lagrangian and, and, and a controlled effective field theory is that you can also see how the corrections from adding of this uh, massive particle in the pseudo-scalar channel changes, you know, the scalar and the, say, J equal 2 state. You see it improves so here, the, the J equal 2 state also didn't quite match the data. Uh, well, here it matches much better. So that's basically a, 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 a virtue of having a, a consistent effective field theory um, as I was opposed to phenomenological implication. Uh, and uh, uh, now uh, the another thing that, that I wanted to say uh, is that we can, again, I mean, the theory, we can make some prediction. For example, there should be a uh, two axion state on the lattice, and this is again. So these are the plots that I took from uh, Andreas uh, and Mike's very recent paper, uh, and and so this is in particular this the, the two axion state that again matches quite well. But again, I wanted to say there are many 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 other states, and we haven't processed this data yet. But the uh, idea is that uh, with with our theory, uh, we can also see if the predictions for uh, for other levels, the more subtle predictions, if they also match. So then, uh, so finally, the, the, uh, the again, I think the biggest, uh, you know, uh, lesson as theorists that we can learn from here is that, uh, so many people uh, wanted you know, the lightest excitation of world sheet uh, to be a scalar, some sort of dilaton, uh, but it is not. Okay, and we believe that this this fact is actually an important hint to what the structure of the QCD confining uh, string is. Uh, and, and in fact, the axon is very natural from the uh, UV or, or say lattice description because you can uh, uh, think of gallstones. Like if we construct our polygon uh, loop, the gallstone that basically correspond to insertion plaquettes like this, uh, while the state with quantum number of axon is another simple plaquettes that can be inserted in the orthogonal direction. Uh, and then we have this conjecture uh, that, that in the pure Young-Mills uh, flux you see axion is actually the only uh, state, the only world sheet resonance, you know, the only uh, zero in the uh, S matrix, if you like, of the, of the world sheet theory uh, that is enough to unitarize and to be complete this, but okay, this is, I say, this is not, uh, conjecture based on some intuition we have and supported by data to some extent, but by no means proven. Excuse me, is this action, what, is it massless or massive? Sorry, I said explicitly that it is massive, right? Uh, uh, so here is the mass uh, uh, is given, I didn't tell you what the mass is, but the mass say, for SU3, SU3 theory is given by uh, 1.85 and string units or something. Okay. Then I want to ask a question. You scatter two massless uh, sort of goldstone particles, right? Yes. And then uh, you know that it's scattering is considered in the expansion in the powers of the momentum. It's like scattering pion and establishing rho meson from the scattering of pion. Exactly. If you know only low order uh, chiral Lagrangian, right? Because you don't take into account higher derivatives, and in any fa in any way you will have to to know all orders and higher in derivatives in order to establish the firmly the position of Romazon. If you just study the scattering of power. yeah, the the the, the Romazon or the axon is established just from the data, right? And I think the concern that you may have 
is that mass of this axion uh, is, you know, order one and string units. So how come I trust the resonance, uh, but I don't uh, uh, say include, you know, there are also some higher derivative uh, Yes, uh, that's a, corrections. That's a good, uh, my question. Yes. 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 It, it is again. It is a valid question, and so there is no parametric separation between uh, uh, this uh, and this. But then, what we actually do, you know, we uh, calculate the uh, you know the one loop term in the number of direction that gives us some estimate for some order one coefficient that can be here, and then we actually you know evaluate this term on the energy that corresponds to the mass of this axion, uh, right. and we see that it is small, okay? And that we put in, in our, you know, systematic theoretical um, error bars that are, you know, quarter, say, 10 percent in all so this. So in, in the uh -huh. language I used, it is as if raw mass and mass would be abnormally small, not exactly zero, but not, uh, but smaller. Yeah, than... somewhat, somewhat smallish, yeah. yeah. And then there is some copiology that helps. Okay. Yeah, Misha, this all this all valid questions and okay. This is it is yeah. a little bit phenomenological what's going on here. The only thing I can refer you to the data, you know, to the extent that we are confident that there is Romas, and I think to the same extent we're confident that there is this axion and, and that that uh, there are not many other states with comparable mass and if, even with the mass that you know twice that or uh, yeah, but but in in this sense, look. Uh, yeah, let, want, me, let me yeah, proceed yeah, a little yeah. bit further, okay? And then maybe we can use the remaining tasks okay. for the discussion. Uh, so uh, very quickly, what about uh, uh, three dimensions? Uh, uh, lattice data is even more precise. Uh, no action possible by quantum numbers, and also there are no uh, no massive modes uh, that I've seen. However, lattice data uh, shows uh, convincingly. Uh, splitting between levels that 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 fails the uh, integrability of the theory. Okay, as uh, I can I can explain, as can be seen from this plot, basically splitting between this this and these levels. Um, uh, that uh, that is the one that tells us that 3D uh, Young Mills flux cube cannot be integrable. Uh, okay, uh, again, uh, very quick. How much time do I have left? Um, well, you're basically out, but you had a few questions, so can you... Okay, let me try to minutes? finish in, yeah. in three minutes, yes. So I say very quickly, so there is uh, the uh, ideas uh, the, to constrain the world sheet S matrix uh, using the bootstrap, okay, uh, which is the, instead of using uh, just effective field theory, we put some uh, idea of crossing and unitality that are valid all the way to the UV, and then uh, there is some constraint of what the Wilson coefficient in the action could be, and then one hopes that the physical theory like close the boundary. So one thing, so, so this results from this paper, there is some boundary for some allowed the Wilson coefficient, and what I wanted to say that, just to point to you, that there are two boundaries, this one and this one, and then on one of these boundary, there is the S matrix has also only one, it's narrow pronounced resonance, uh, which is the axion. And then there is another boundary which uh, has the scalar resonance, uh, which looks more like a alluvial. So it's interesting that from the, uh, this completely complementary approach uh, doesn't lose any lattice input. Uh, the S matrix booted one gets uh, a similar picture. Uh, now, okay, so let me move to the so the future future directions and the, it's a little bit slow on my slide. Um, uh, okay, the 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 future directions part. So what did we learn about the theory of a single confining flux cube? Uh, so it's a non-integrable, well-defined two-dimensional theory with at least one uh, massive resonance, and we hope that we can solve this two-dimensional theory one day. Okay, solve, because it's non-integral, of course, we'll never write some analytic expression, but solve means develop a systematic expansion in some field theoretic terms, as opposed to uh, just uh, using lattice. And, for example, could this theory be a relevant deformation of some UV 2D CFT? Because then one could use, if one identified this 2D CFT, one could first solve the CFT, then use some, you know, Hamiltonian truncation, whatever methods. But we almost certainly would think that it's not. Could it be instead a TT bar uh, deformation of uh, some uh, 2D CFT deformed by a relevant operator? Well, that is not completely excluded. 
although uh, again this is this is kind of a concrete question that that maybe we can hope to settle uh relatively soon uh so to answer this kind of question uh there are several interesting so one uh related to what uh, misha was asking uh in a way so what what if we actually take the axial mass to zero what kind of some relative uh of of the qcd string theory uh that actually can be integral because once the axial mass is taken to zero then this term in the actual can can cancel all the particle production uh and the funny thing uh is that there is some sort of triple coincidence uh that the coupling constants needed here to cancel the particle production uh turns out within error bars match both the lattice calculation but also the the coupling constant that comes out from bootstrap so that points to the fact that maybe there is some simplicity some you know, saturation or some dispersion relation roughly speaking uh, that, that we could uh, look for uh and then coming back to the non-integrable string with uh, maxing uh, with the massive axion there are two natural uh, uh, directions to proceed it one is to have some input from perturbative pcd because in principle the high energy limit of the world sheet theory should be describable uh, by perturbative pcd uh and then another direction that that we want to pursue is to uh, look for relations to confining fundamental uh, uh, string backgrounds. And uh, uh, that is, again, these theories are in a different universality class because at least in the uh, supergravity approximation for confining string backgrounds, the leading uh, massive mode on the string will always be uh, some sort of uh, dilaton. Uh, but uh, it's it's likely that uh, the if we have some confining string backgrounds, say like Modesen and Nunes, uh, and this is by the way inspired a lot by Sheen's discussion where he gave many more details. If we consider a long string uh, sitting at the uh, at the bottom of this uh, of this rope, we can ask what is the Rothschild theory on this on this long string, and it is likely that for any confining background, it will also be non-integrable. Uh, so, so again, we can ask what is the UV completion of uh, of, of non-integrable world sheet theories that arise uh, in this uh, confining uh, string background. Uh, so, yeah, let me let let me, let me finish here. I'll, I'll just oh, sorry, I, I'm surprised my slide is so ridiculously slow. Uh, the uh, let me let me leave you with the conclusions and uh, uh, see if we still have any any time for for discussion of the questions. Okay, let's uh, thank Victor. Okay, uh, we have time for a few quick questions. I have a guy with a leaf blower just outside my window, so if you don't hear me. Uh, so over, go ahead. <laughs> so I have a very quick question. I mean, what's the width of this axon particle? Uh... Yeah, in, in mass units, it's small. It's like, the, I don't know, maybe less than 20%, I think. Uh, and then, you know, in, in, in numbers, as I said, it is the width is what determines uh, this, uh, this, this Q coupling. But of course, okay, some dimensional is coupling some units. But it is, it is a relatively narrow red. Thanks. Pedro? Uh, hi. Uh, is there some computation uh, that you could do to make contact with this state that the mass was twice the, the axiom that Andreas was mentioning? The, uh, let me repeat the okay. statement. The, the mass uh, of the lightest glue ball, which is a scalar, is twice the mass of the axiom. That, that is the statement. And yeah, I do not have a very, well, okay, you could think that the lightest glue ball is some sort of composite, you know, state of uh, two axioms, uh, but I do not really see why, why that would be the case. Uh, no, but uh, yeah. sorry, I thought that at large n, we would not see globals, and yet we, uh, Andreas was mentioning a state whose mass was twice the mass of uh, your axiom. No, there is. Yeah, let, let 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 me let me clarify a little bit. So Andreas and Mike on the lattice on on the world sheet, they saw a state which is a scalar. Okay, so you see the slides now, which is a scalar. Okay, that's over here, and in the effective field theory description, the state looks very much much just like two axioms at rest okay so it is some full goldstone state roughly speaking but you can think of you know two goldstone scattering producing a resonance two other goldstone scattering producing a resonance so then there are these two resonance sitting on the string 
So that's like the S metric description of the state. Okay. And then, of course, not surprisingly, the state has mass twice of the axion. Then there is an, another statement that I think uh, uh, Andres uh, uh, mentioned is that numerically, you know, when you put in the QCD uh, or Young Mills, you know, numbers, the, the twice the mass of the axion is also the mass of the lightest global. But okay, that uh, I, I do not know what, what to make out of it. No, no, um, uh, I didn't say that. I mean, I mean, the, the light of the mass of the of the light of the light is global is slightly, I mean, below. It's around, um, um, uh, I don't know what what is it. Uh, three is around uh, a root sigma of three, I think, of the um, of the global. I mean. That's what you said, right? I mean, the twice. The... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. Then. No. No. Yeah. But it's not the parameter. That... Yeah. Okay. It's yeah, close. Yeah. The but mixing yeah, not... with the mixing with blue balls is uh, basically basically is is vanishing. I mean, there, there will be no mixing with blue balls. I mean. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the comment was related to the fact that we are kind of sure that it's a world sheet two axiom state as opposed to you know string plus plus a blue ball, right? So we can be confident. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Fine. Hey, Zohar, can you? Yes, I had. In the holographic constructions that you mentioned at the end, where would this axiom come from? Like in the green Schwartz string, I see a dilaton-like mode, namely the radial mode of, in ADS, but where is this axiom? Yeah, Zogar, very, very good question. That's exactly the point I was trying to make, right? It's, it's interesting to study, uh, you know, the thing, uh, something from, from, from an ML3, but it looks like a different theory. Now, of course, uh, if, if we want to go to something more like QCD or even N equal one QCD, we need to uh, go very far away from the Sugra approximation, right? So the bulk becomes very stringy and somehow there should be like a phase, you know, some transition where the lightest mode becomes the axion uh, as opposed to the dilaton. So, you know, there are various ideas for how to explore it. One comment maybe I can make is that in N equals four, uh, the string, there is a regime at least, this, you know, the, the weakly coupled in the bulk regime where the lightest mode on the N equals four uh, string is a pseudoscalar, which comes as a composite of some two fermions. But that is, of course, I mean, a very different thing, a very different string because it's some, you know, quickly rotating string as opposed to a straight string. So that's one comment. Another comment is that it would be interesting to construct, uh, uh, some sort of, uh, Polyakov uh, like description of this integrable axionic string. So that, you know, we don't have that so far, but if we have that, maybe it will also tell us some, you know, sigma model or some geometric meaning of it. And that's something we, 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 we've been discussing. Yeah, related while, to that, but... I had a very, very related question. So maybe one more second. Uh, what about supersymmetric theories? Is this a BPS particle in some situations? Uh, yeah, okay, so I do not know about, of course, there are, say, supersymmetric confining theories, and we know the massless spectrum there, there are some Galskinas as opposed to Goldstones, but uh, nobody, I have simulated those on the logic, so we don't know what the spectrum of massive states. In any no, but we know, cases. like, there, are this, there is this papers by David Tong, and uh, I forgot the second author, embarrassingly. But anyway, they have the full massive BPS spectrum of some strings. Ah. In in N equal, but N equals two is not confining, as you told us yesterday. No, they have some uh, version. Uh, it's not confining, but you know, they still have the full BPS spectrum of some some sort of uh, string. Uh, yeah, Zofra, let's discuss. I mean, I know nothing about about the paper you mentioned. So. It's in these models where there is a Fayeliopoulos term that Misha mentioned, and they they have the full spectrum of some in for two comma two strings. Yeah, yeah. I, I do not know the spectrum, so I cannot, uh, I mean, you should tell me what it is. Okay. I, I think we should probably uh, stop may, here. May I just ask a quick question, please? Okay, uh, quick. Victor, uh, there was a question before about the width of the axion. What does it decay to? Yeah, it just decays into two goldstones, right? The only stable uh, states on the string are the goldstones, X say the transfer oscillation, they're massless. And the axion is basically, so I have goldstones, I call them X2 and X3. 
And Oxygen is, you know, some uh, state where they are anti-symmetrized on those indices, right? So, so that state has the same quantum numbers as the axiom. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's uh, thank uh, Victor again.